Great. Good morning, everybody. This is Sarah Johnson with Access, and welcome to our part four series um, of provider training for the HCBS rules. This one's uh, this series is entitled HCBS Implementation in a COVID-19 World, and today we'll be focused on the DDD Day program. Just a little bit of housekeeping. Um, we are going to have a brief presentation. And so while we do the presentation, we'll make sure everybody is muted just to um, uh, mitigate any background noise. After the presentation, please use the raise your hand feature. Um, you can see that at the bottom of your um, screen. Um, and uh, if you would like to um, uh, verbally share with us any questions or comments that you have, or you can also use the Q&A chat box. Um, so please go ahead and use the Q&A, uh, the Q&A, excuse me, chat box if you'd like to ask a question or share a comment. If somebody has um, uh, shared a similar feedback to what you would like to um, comment during the session, you can click on the like button next to their comment. That just helps us know how to prioritize um, topics of discussion or uh, feedback that you all would like to provide. And then also, if you have any specific ideas, today we're really gonna want to um, facilitate a dialogue between uh, those of you in the industry. And so if you have a particular idea you wanna share, maybe you're not comfortable sharing it verbally, um, please definitely go ahead and use that Q&A chat box to share so that we can keep track of um, all of the great input from today's session. Uh, as uh, Danielle mentioned, we are recording the session as well as we are going to be taking some notes, but um, it certainly helps us if you can uh, utilize that Q&A option um, to uh, uh, make sure we capture all of your valuable input. Next slide. So our objectives for today. Um, one thing is it's been, a, it's been a while since we've all um, come together to talk about the HCBS rules. So we're gonna do a brief refresher of the overall intent of the rules. Um, I think it's really helpful to talk about the intent of the rules, particularly as we're struggling with options for, you know, how do we comply and, and to support creativity. It's really important for us to just and the underlying principle around the HCBS rules. And then of course, it's important to understand the, the rules themselves. So Danielle's going to talk um, and provide an overview of what are the HCBS rules in practice? Like, what are we looking for specifically um, as a um, introduction to our discussion today? She'll also talk about the quality monitoring assessment and process. So this is the process where the health plans, which includes DDD, are going to, um, as they do today, they do quality monitoring visits. So they're gonna be looking at the HCBS rules as part of those visits. And, and it's gonna look a little bit differently. Um, so we'll talk, uh, do a refresher on that. And all that will just take maybe about 15 minutes or so. And then we want the rest of the session is really the goal for today is um, we're gonna help facilitate a brainstorming and discussion session with all of you to talk a little bit about, you know, what are those things that you've done? How have you um, changed your business practices and what are practices you're considering changing in the future when COVID is less of a risk? Um, and those things that really help to align with the specific person-centered practices required by the HCBS rules. We also want you to be um, to share what challenges you're experiencing. The idea being that you guys are peers um, in the industry on the on the phone today and in the webinar, and this is really an opportunity to hear from your peers. Um, this is really a no judgment zone, so we want you to be comfortable sharing ideas or challenges so that we can really help each other comply as a state. Next slide. The overall intent of the HCBS rules is to one, enhance the quality of the home and community-based services that are provided, and two, provide protections to participants. We really look at these rules as rights afforded to everyone. Um, and so this is an opportunity to really be focused too on the individual participants and how your program supports them and their goal development and then their desires for their life. 
Uh, and then kind of an overarching purpose of the rules is to make sure that people have full access to the benefits of community living. We've done a great job um, in, in, as a testament to the work that you all have been doing to make sure that people receive services in the most integrated setting. And so now we're elevating that by focusing on um, making sure that not only pe do people live and, and work and play in integrated settings, but are they engaged in their broader community to the same degree that, that you or I are engaged in our community, those of us who don't have disabilities or not receiving um, home and community-based services. We recognize to some degree, um, this is a culture shift. Some of you, it may be a bigger culture shift than others. Um, for some of you, it may just be certain aspects of the rules that are a culture shift. So one of the things that, that really is the shift in thinking is that these rules are rights afforded to everybody. Everybody gets them, you don't have to earn them. But certainly, there are gonna be times where access to these rights may prove to be a health and safety risk for an individual. So then we utilize the person-centered process to outline um, and to plan um, for those individuals to have their rights restricted, but also to regain those at some point in time when it's no longer a health and safety um, issue. So the other piece of this is that those restrictions are individualized per, per the individual versus blanket restrictions that providers may impose upon the members that they're serving. Next slide. And I'm going to let you, Danielle, go ahead and take away the um, overall, uh, overview of the HCBS rules in practice. Thank you, Dara. So we're just going to do a quick overview of what the rules might look like um, specifically to DDD day programs. Um, this is just kind of a level setting, make sure we're on the same page before we move forward into the discussion part of our meeting today. Um, the HCBS rules do afford employment services and supports for your day program. This just looks like uh, making sure you support individuals to learn new skills or instruction for that skill development, um, supporting or exploration activity or opportunities. Um, just like just like anyone, really, um, it's important that our members are exposed to different things. Because um, really, how do any of us know what we want to do with our lives or do for work until we're exposed to it in some way? Um, and obviously, this probably looks a lot different right now because of COVID. But there is some downtime <laughs> and lots of, of tools and videos and resources on the Internet um, that it might be a helpful time to kind of do that, you know, career exploration and and see what people would want to do once we can kind of get uh, back up and uh, running to, you know, a more normal um, community integration. Uh, engagement and community life. Um, so we just want to make sure, again, when it's safe because of COVID, that when people interact, um, when people are in a uh, day program, they are able to interact with the general public. Um, in normal times, this might look like someone coming into the setting to participate in, a, in an activity or a training. Um, this could also be um, people engaging in activities in their community. Um, it's important that it's comparable to peers. So like um, when me and my friends get together, we're not, um, you know, doing coloring books and, and or playing chess, you know. Uh, we like movies and concerts, and so when it's safe to do that, um, maybe is there some way that you can incorporate the activities your your um, participants want to do, or at least work towards a goal of getting there. Um, we want to make sure that, that people are engaged in activities in their communities, uh, even if it's just going to a park or going to the library, again, when it's safe to do so. Um, and do individuals have support staff to assist them in participating in activities in the community? Um, you know, if they have a, a physical thing they need help with, are, are they getting that support to make sure that they can um, participate in activities in the community? Control of personal resources. Uh, we just want to make sure someone, they, uh, that individuals have someone to assist them in managing their, their personal funds. 
do they get to decide how to spend their money uh, for a day program? This might be something as simple as purchasing a snack or being able to, um, just, just like any of us do when we're out in the community. Um, and then again, you know, different now because of COVID, but when people can get back out to the community, are they able to purchase goods and services, just going to the store, um, you know, stopping at a Circle K for a Coke, is that all possible? Um, is pay for work rendered directly to the person or is it given to their representative um, instead? And are individuals um, either employed or preparing for employment provided with information about how those, their benefits are affected by employment income? Um, I know Access offers, uh, I believe it's called DB 101, the whole course on how working may or may not impact your benefits. Uh, so we just wanna make sure people have access to information available to them um, so they are making informed decisions. Uh, receiving services in the community to the same degree of access as other people, um, which is important right now, especially because of COVID. We're all obviously not out in the community right now. We completely understand that. We don't expect you to put your members at risk. And you, if you look at some of our other trainings, we discussed the transition plan and your health plan or DDD. We'll talk to you about that and um, further getting assessed. But that's where you can talk about some of the things you're doing differently because of COVID and how you'll get back to normal. Um, so some of these things, can individuals engage in activities that are specific to their skills, abilities, desires, needs, and preferences? Um, including with people of their own choosing and in areas of their own choosing. So like, is everyone forced to go to a rec room or do they have maybe some option of a rec room or let's work outside today because it's nice. Um, you know, can I choose, I wanna work on this activity and can I do it with my friend or do I have to only do it with, with the people who I'm assigned to work with? Are individuals given the choice and opportunity to freely come and go from the setting? Um, so if I don't have any uh, health and safety issues, can I go down to Circle K real quick and get a Coke if, if the setting doesn't have anything I want? Um, just things like that. And then do individuals have, didn't, oh, sorry. <laughs> do individuals have access to transportation to and from the setting for uh, the purposes of that uh, engaging in community life? This doesn't mean that the setting has to provide that transportation but are you working with the member and their, maybe their family, their friends, um, you know, people in their community that can provide that transportation, uh, whether it's, you know, a ride share service or, you know, this person wants to participate in an activity at the local church, can someone from the church come and pick them up and bring them back? Just things like that, just really pop problem solving. Um, setting selection. So do you, as the program, allow individuals to visit prior to choosing to participate in the day program? So, you know, whether you obviously looking different right now, everything looks different, but in normal times, do you offer tours? Um, can individuals maybe share a meal or participate in an activity? You know, really just to get a feel for who's there um, to see if it's, it's some, something they want to participate in or if there's people there that they think they can get along with. and the person-centered plan. So does the setting provide support so that your members can participate in the person-centered plan? Is the setting itself participating in the person-centered planning meetings? Um, does the setting provide updates on the individual's uh, progress? And does the program align with the person-centered plan? So just uh, really, we want, we want you guys to participate in those person-centered planning meetings you are part of the bigger team that helps these individuals attain their goals and, and what you do is important. So um, it's just important to be part of those meetings to hear what that individual might want to accomplish and figure out where you fit into that goal. Privacy, dignity, and respect. Um, so I think this is for most cases less of a concern. I think this is something most of you guys do well, but just making sure individuals receive personal care assistance in private, um, people have information about their rights in plain language, 
and they know who to contact if they have concern or complaint. And of course, we want everyone to have protection against restrictive measures that include isolation, chemical, pharmacological, and physical restraints. Um, that's something we really want to see at all. Autonomy and accessibility. Are individuals, are individuals able to make informed decisions about the, what they want to do every day? Understanding your program, but are there options of what people can do? Um, you know, instead of doing this activity, do you want to do this? Uh, we know you're limited on resources and probably can't have everyone doing their own thing. Um, but definitely just having options available is important. And then making sure that the setting is accessible for people to freely move around the setting, including entering and exiting. This is a little different than ADA requirements. This is uh, really specific to not blocking doorways. You know, if someone needs to go outside and they don't have any health or safety restrictions, can they do that? Can they just sit outside for a minute? Um, things like that. We don't want people, uh, you know, locked anywhere. We want them to be able to move around. Individual choice. So can people request for alternate staff members to assist them? If I really, really like working with Dara, you know, she may not be available five days a week to help me, but can um, can I work with the setting and Dara to figure out when she is available? Can we work together? Um, and can people freely make those requests uh, for the way that their services and supports are delivered? Again, we understand you have staffing constraints and things may not happen tomorrow, but can we work towards the request um, um, to honor it at some point? So those, that's basically the HCBS rules at a very high level. Uh, we do have more trainings on our website and we'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, so to go over the quality monitoring tools and the process, um, it's really a tool suite um, when you are selected, your health plan or DDD will reach out to you directly. They'll provide you with a self-assessment tool that you'll have to complete. Um, you'll have to submit some documentation to support your answers on that tool. Um, and then the health plan will either come out for an on-site assessment if you're comfortable with that, um, or they'll schedule something remotely. Um, just you know, we're we're all living in these weird times right now. So if they can come out to an onsite and you're okay with that, please let the health plan know what would make you comfortable. <laughs> you know, obviously you probably want masks and social distancing. Um, if you want them to come out on site, just make sure you have that list ready so you can communicate it when whenever you're scheduled for your assessment. Um, obviously, we can't get a full picture of what happens at your setting just from your self-assessment. So we also um, include member interviews as part of the process. And again, this might look a little different right now. Um, you know, it, it could be a group of members being interviewed by the health plan at one time, just to kind of get everybody's feeling for what's going on. Um, so the health plan doesn't have to you know, reach out to people individually or try to meet with people face to face just because that's not happening right now. Um, we also include an observation tool. Um, so if the health plan can come out on site, they're just gonna write down, you know, kind of what they're noticing while they're there. Um, just making sure everyone can kind of meet, move freely around, you know, have choice, things like that. If you have to do it, Remotely, it might be a, a webinar similar to this, just with video access, so you can kind of show the health plan what's happening at your setting. And then we also do community interviews. Um, really, this isn't just going out to anyone near your setting and asking them questions about your setting. It's talking to people who interact with your setting uh, regularly. So this may be uh, people that come in for. Um, uh, to participate in, in trainings or um, activities or whatever it may look like, but someone who doesn't work for you that does interact, um, if you have someone available, the health plan might just want to call with them to just um, so they can really talk about the great things that you're doing and, and how your members are 
positively affected. And again, so some MCOs may want to see if they can do an on-site. Um, that's really up to you and the health plan working together to make sure that's going to work um, since we're in the middle of this fun pandemic. All right, Dara, I'll throw it back over to you. Great. Thank you, Danielle. So a few tips um, for HCBS rules compliance. So the first thing is be creative. Um, you have a lot of creative um, opportunity to do HCBS rules compliance, look for um, it with respect to your setting, with the members that you serve, with their preferences. So there's a, so um, sometimes creativity isn't comfortable when we're talking about compliance, but we really do want you to think creatively uh, particularly with your developing new practices. Um, the other thing is when you do get the notice of the assessment um, by the health plan, in this case, DDD, um, be creative with documenting or you will meet, um, how you do meet or you will meet the standard. Um, you can use video, you can use pictures, you can use policies and procedures. Um, there's a number of different things that um, you can do to, um, to demonstrate that compliance. So be creative. We've also talked a little bit, or Danielle referenced the transition plan. Um, and just want to note that, that all of these documents will put up on the website um, it, shortly. We're making some final revisions to these documents. But utilize the transition plan, which is really the plan that talks about what are you doing during COVID to mitigate risk, but also still maximizing integration um, as best as you can. And then also, you know, what are you going to do differently once COVID is less of a risk and we can start to make those lifestyle changes that we've all missed over the last year. So um, think of it as, as your opportunity to highlight the work that you've been doing um, and, and what you're going to continue to do. Next slide, please. So I want to take a moment and do a little bit of reflection um, before we get into the dialogue. Because I think this is, I think we have, much like many of us, right, we've learned a lot of lessons with COVID, both personally and professionally. Some of us have learned hey, how to work better working from home and how to be more efficient, take the most of that opportunity from a professional sense. Um, in a personal sense, maybe we've benefited by having more family time or more time to dedicate to self-care, other things. Um, so in the context of the HCBS rules, we wanted to take an opportunity to um, highlight uh, or reflect a little bit on what we've all experienced in the last year and how that might give us some insight into how our members might feel um, before even COVID was a reality. Um, so think of just for a moment about whether or not you've experienced social isolation in the past year as a result of COVID. I think also about how has COVID restricted your ability to engage in meaningful activities? And it's probably yes, right? Many of us had restrictions imposed upon us that maybe we would have been willing to take the risk, but somebody else decided that they weren't willing for us to take the risk for the greater good. So what did we do creatively to connect with people and engage in activities that were meaningful to us? Um, so my guess is we've all experienced social isolation as a result of COVID, right? We had restrictions imposed upon us. We had concerts canceled. We had vacations canceled. We'd had, um, you know, going to the mall and going shopping canceled. Um, those are things that were maybe meaningful to us or large family gatherings, right? So what did we do? We, you know, everybody used Zoom and we figured out how to use Zoom to, to, to connect with people that were meaningful to us. Or, um, you know, maybe we did meet with people, but we met with them in the park six feet apart because they were just somebody that we really wanted to, to connect with. So when we talk about the HCBS rules and the intent of the rules, right, we really are talking about 
you know, making sure nobody's socially isolated, making sure nobody has restrictions imposed upon them um, to things that are meaningful, unless it's warranted for health and safety reasons. And then, um, you know, during COVID, you know, we should also be working and applying creative ways to make sure that those people um, that we serve can, in, can engage in meaningful activities. And, and I have every bit of confidence that, that you all have done that. I think you all have maybe done different things. So kind of taking upon these lessons of what we've all experienced and, and thinking and making an assumption for the purposes of the conversation that our members experienced these things before COVID. And, and hopefully with the HWS rules, they don't experience it after COVID, right? And that we can come back better and stronger um, um, and, and our ability to be creative, to accommodate these kinds of things, to help all of us think about uh, ways to comply with the HCBS rules. So with that said, um, Danielle, let's go ahead to our first question. And I do want to acknowledge that we do have um, some really, really questions <clears throat> um, in um, the Q&A. Um, I think I'm going to save them for the second question because I think these are things that would be important to ask your peers. Um, so we're going to hold off on those for just a second, but we'll get back to them. But let's go to the first question. And we really want you to, to speak out about this. And if you if you want to um, speak verbally, please go ahead and raise your hand. It'll give us a second to unmute you, but please go ahead and feel free to do that. So let's first talk about, okay, when we talk about a COVID world and um, what we're experiencing right now, although things are getting better, um, relative to the, to the areas of the HCBS rules that include things that we've gone over, involving members in the community, individualizing member choice, integrating your settings into the community, what practices and activities did you have to curtail in order to assure member health and safety during the public health emergency? And then what innovative practices and activities did you replace them with? Right, it's that whole idea of, you know, we had to restrict activity and engagement. So, but what did we do to try to create meaningful connections and activities um, that might have been innovative? And I want to just clarify that innovative. You may not think something you did is innovative because it's something you did, and it was just natural and normal to you and to your agency and your setting. But please share it because it may be something that somebody else didn't think about. And that's really the purpose of today's session. So we really want, we don't want you to get this information from us. We want you to connect with your peers about what you did. So we need folks to be willing to share. Is there anybody who would like to speak on this topic before we talk about sort of how we come back stronger um, after the HCBS rules. Oh, it looks like Chris McNamara has uh, raised his hand. So I have allowed you to talk. You may be double muted. Um, you may have to unmute your computer, um, the Zoom thing, and your phone, just an FYI. Oh, okay, thanks. Can, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, great. Uh, so yeah, we've done a few things. Um, uh, again, kind of to your point, not sure how innovative it, it is, but obviously we weren't able to go out with our groups to uh, to the movies or to um, any uh, museums over the past year or so. So one one thing that we did to uh, to kind of replace that is we would have social distancing in our larger vehicles and take uh, very small groups out on drives throughout town to you know in the van in our vans uh, just to at least get out of our our main facility and to, to get out a little bit into the community. So again, not nothing that was really, you know, out of this world, but uh, it's, you know, it, it was an attempt to to get out a little bit. And Chris, can I ask a follow-up question? So, how did you determine where you went? You know, well, one of the, sometimes it would just be literally just to to, to go go for drives. But um, another thing we did was actually to go 
uh, drove by and waved to members who had um, self quarantined, and we would go to their uh, <laughs> go to their homes and wave to them from the uh, from the vehicles. And um, uh, as as far as how we how we uh, selected those those things, I think staff, you know, just being honest, it would have we it probably would have been better if we were uh, more inclusive with with generating ideas. Um, but I think a lot of the ideas ultimately came from staff. Great, thank you for sharing. Sure. Would anybody else like to share? Oh, it looks like Diane Logan's raising her hand. So I'm going to, to um, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, perfect. Um, you know, obviously with the closure uh, of, uh, or, or with the pandemic, um, we did close uh, most of our programs uh, during the pandemic and offered, um, offered home and community or offered day treatment services in the home. And so while we were doing those things, we, you know, tried to do more one-on-one -on -one things of, of, you know, going for a walk outside, going out for a picnic, that kind of thing. Um, we're still trying to, now that we're reopening next month, we're still trying to uh, get out into the community by doing more of those outdoor things while we can, while the weather's so nice right now. Um, we've actually, actually reached out to um, uh, the zoo in Tucson to see if they would be interested in doing um, a, a, a day where we could go, where our day programs could go there when it's not necessarily open to the rest of the public so that we could have, have it be our individuals going and, and utilizing, being able to go to the zoo um, and maintain social distancing and being safe um, there with other members that, that we know to see are, are being safe. So, you know, we're just trying to be really creative in the types of things we're also looking at doing rather than having a guest speaker come into the day program. We're looking at doing, um, having some presentations done by YouTube, you know, for those individuals who uh, would enjoy engaging that way over the computer or watching um, a presentation uh, from the, someone in the community or someone from outside of our community learning about or their their local community learning about something else in another another area where they that's a new exposure to them so we're just really looking at trying to be super creative and I'm really impressed with some of the ideas that staff have come up with of, of what we can do to be engaged and be safe at the same time Thank you, Diane. Um, it looks like Ali Schroeder would also like to share. So I am opening up your line. And you may be double muted, just an FYI. Are you there, Ali? Okay. Well, it looks like we also have Kamisha Bowen. Hello? Hello, we can hear you. Who is this? Uh, this is Manuel uh, from Inner Mountain Center. I don't know if Hi. you can well, see me. <laughs> we can hear you. Go ahead and share. Uh, yes. Uh, we were very fortunate where we did not close our day program uh, ever since the pandemic had started. You know, we continued, you know, to use every precaution that we could take, you know, for our members. So we have been very fortunate, you know, that all of them have been well, no problems. And we do take the members, uh, like up to Arizona, at that time, they had this, just a drive-through, you know, they weren't able to get out of their 
their vehicle, but they were able to drive through and we take our members up there and we've taken uh, members down to uh, Anthem Way. You know, I understand that there's a very nice park, you know, down there. And all of the, the shops, you know, stores or, you know, like in an outdoor, so they would, you know, walk around down there and go up to like the mall, you know, to have lunches there and, you know, walk around up there, you know, so, and also a lot of um, uh, outdoor, you know, activities, you know, bowling, playing with ball on nice days. So we have, you know, been very busy, you know, uh, coming up with, you know, the staff, you know, coming up with excellent, you know, uh, activities to help them, you know, to work through this, you know, pandemic. So we have been very busy and a lot of uh, indoor activities, you know, whether it's, you know, coloring, you know, Christmas, of course, you know, you know, decorations. And also, you um, uh, there was a Christmas tree that we had, a live Christmas tree had planted outside. You know, they put lights on it and they made decorations and uh, put it on the tree. It's still on there. <laughs> it's still on there. There are different types of, you know, ornaments, you know, on there. So we have been very busy and, you know, keeping, you know, all kinds of activities, you know, suggestions, you know, from the staff. So. It's uh, still, you know, ongoing as far as with the warm weather coming, you know, what other places uh, can the members, you know, be taken to? They were talking about, um, again, going back up to Arizona now, I believe they're able to walk to, you know, certain places there and uh, they've been uh, planning on going up to the Grand Canyon, you know, it's just out in the open. so coming up with a lot of, you know, ideas, you know, activities that they can do, you know, and still have the social distance and be involved. So we have been very fortunate, you know, that we were able to take the members out. Thank you so much for sharing. I think, I think what we're hearing in Danielle, I'll um, also go through a couple of the Q&A comments, but thank you. I think that's a, an important theme that sounds like a lot of outdoor activities, a lot of activities where um, you can socially distance um, and even some creativity around that, like um, Diane, the zoo idea or going out into open spaces like parks. And so just a couple of things I'll share from the Q&A huh. um, uh, for everybody else. Um, and then we'll get to the next person who wants to kind of talk um, as well. So thank you so much for sharing. Um, you know, obviously folks employed a lot of the, the expected health and safety um, mitigation strategies like temperature checks and things like that. Um, um, one provider said they sent out, we miss you cards um, to those members who maybe decided um, they weren't comfortable coming in. So that's great staying connected to people and letting them know they're important um, regardless of um, um, you know, them not being at the program. Um, another provider talked about Zoom tours of museums around the world. That's interesting. So getting people exposed to things maybe they wouldn't normally be exposed to. Um, uh, also individuals who weren't attending exercise class, maybe taught exercise class to others. Um, and then another kind of echoing the drive-by parade to members who were at home. So that's great. Um, one provider also started an internal competition of walking 100 miles by the end of the year, as well as reading chapter books. So that's good, kind of taking that um, uh, role that we've all played to try to work on self-care, right? And so that's a great idea. So competitions um, related to some, you know, both outdoor and indoor activities. Um, and then um, Kay mentioned that they did a game with those who were home playing along with Zoom with our members who were present at the program. So great. 
So again, another creative way to do um, remote, <laughs> uh, remote engagement and remote game playing. Um, and so um, that's, a, that's, a, that's a great idea. Great, great example again of just trying to stay connected to people. All right, let's go ahead and see if anybody else has, um, Danielle, do we have any other hands raised? Uh, it looks like we had some hands lowered. <laughs> Um, oh, okay. But please, if you want to, oh, um, Kamisha Brown, or I'm sorry, Bowen, my apologies. Um, you may have to unmute on your computer as well, but um, please share. Oh, looks like she lowered her hand. Um, if you'd like to share on the phone, just please uh, raise your hand and I can uh, let you talk. Uh, Chris McNamara again. Yeah, one, I'll just... Um, a couple of other points I guess I, I can share with the group. We've we've tied in our uh, our TTE curriculum a little bit, and we've tried to do some of that work with our DTA members just to start to get a little exposure to employment um, while we've had, uh, you know, a little more downtime, if you will. And then um, also we, we also used the virtual services so that we could provide virtual DTA uh, for some of our members who were uh, staying at home. And that kept folks uh, connected a little bit more. And we've also been going out to uh, to the parks now uh, more recently, um, but just staying as, as a small group and away from, from others. So those are just a few other things I thought I'd share with the group. Great, that's awesome. Thank, Thank you. you. And we're definitely seeing a lot in the chat, Danielle, around virtual meetings, uh, virtual group um, supports, as well as one-on-one. -on -one. Um, somebody did some creative art groups, trivia, brain games, um, more exercise, and even some great discussion groups, which is um, that's certainly great um, to get people um, talking about different things and learning from each other. Let's see. Um, Yumi, I hope I'm saying that right, said we connect members who are at home and on campus via daily Zoom with structured activities, including conversation, cultural exploration, birthday parties, art instructions, games, music, exercise. Um, we also had a virtual tour of two different states, national parks, museums. Um, members voted on where they would like to go visit. Um, lots more about, um, we also had virtual discussions and art making of, um, about social issues with university students. So. That's great, bringing in other people to be part of that conversation. Um, certainly would like to know more about that. That sounds really great. Um, um, so obviously, you know, comments around, you know, virtual is great, but it certainly doesn't replace um, uh, individual, you know, connecting uh, in person. Um, lots more about different kinds of parties or, you know, outdoor activities, um, music therapy, um, uh, let's see, dance parties, computer activities, gardening projects outdoors um, will be starting soon. So it looks like even some of you might be trying to get more to your kind of regular um, programming. Um, just looking here to see what I like. Um, Chris, I, I think I failed to mention, I like what you said about how you took the opportunity during this time to engage members with some of the employment curriculum, which I think is a really good, um, in general with the HCBS rules, as, as um, Daniel mentioned, we want day programs to be thinking about the next steps for people. And so I think that's a really good way to start those discussions early and get folks um, 
um, you know, starting to, to kind of expand their world a little bit to consider what those options might be. Yeah, we've had we've had some success. Uh, I think we've had like two folks that uh, started to sign up for TTE for a couple days a week. So it's uh, it's actually yielded a few results for us. That's fantastic. That's great. That's a great testimony to that. Oh, we have great, some great, great. raised hands. Um, Angela Bessemer, you should be able to unmute yourself now. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay. Well, I just wanted to share that uh, one of the other things that we've done is we've um, kind of pulled the community um, opportunities here, like the bowling alleys and the zoos and a couple other places to see what they um, have put into place to keep their visitors safe. Um, and if their practices meet our practices or our you know, safety requirements, mm -hmm. then we will let small groups go to those um, areas. We have had a few um, groups going out bowling and they've really enjoyed that. And um, of course the zoo has some very strict practices that adhere to ours. So we've been going to the zoo. Um, and then the other thing we did was we polled guardians and parents to see what their comfort levels were as far as, um, you know, starting to access the community with our safety um, protocols in place. And uh, we've been pleasantly surprised. Pretty much everybody has agreed that it's okay to start going um, some of the places like you know, the zoo and bowling and um, the parks, of course, and um, we do a lot of drive through. And, um, and so we're just kind of slowly getting some confidence back, you know, people are starting to get vaccinated, and um, feeling a little bit more confident. So we're getting more and more people back in our programs now. Um, and we're really working on how we can keep the social distance in our programs and of course in our vehicles um, and still access the community and provide day program services. So um, it's been a juggle, but we've been doing it. Thank you. Thank you, Angela. I love, I love hearing what you guys are all doing. You're so creative. I'm, I'm getting ideas myself on what I can do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, very cool. Uh, Lisa Wilkins, I'm going to go ahead and allow you to unmute. And you might have to double unmute your computer and your phone. I'm just listening in to get ideas. Oh. Okay, no problem, Lisa. Good to have you. Um, how about Grace Jones? Would you like to talk? Grace Jones. Well, um, yeah, yell. I'm sorry if I said that wrong. Yes, Younger. No. So oh, that's fine. Fine. I can hear. Well, anyone who had their hands raised, I uh, did go ahead and you should be able to unmute yourselves if you'd like to um, share. Okay, okay maybe while we're waiting, we're waiting for those folks to figure out how to unmute themselves, then you know, maybe I can go over a few more things from the chat. Um, sure. Marita um, mentioned that their day program is generally like more of a, like a recreational program. Um, and so they usually do things uh, one to three hours in the evening. So they said they send out calendars with activities such as line dancing, movie night, arts and crafts, et cetera. And then the members pick the activities they want to participate in. So that's really interesting, um, just kind of as a general model. And she says, during COVID, we did walks, movie nights, exercise classes, line dancing, bingo, activities at the library and karaoke. So 
again, good way to sort of say, hey, um, you know, get interest from members and then plan the activities around that and let members pick, um, uh, you know, what they would, um, you know, like to do. So that sounds great. Um, okay, I think Grace is having some audio problems. I'm sorry, Grace, maybe you can type in your feedback. Um, so let's see. Should we move on um, to the second question? Second question, yeah, I think so. Let's see if I can get PowerPoint to work with me. There we go. Okay. All right, for the second question, um, and I think there are some uh, items in the chat that I think we can we can also point to. So thinking about, which is kind of the transition period that sounds like a lot of you are in, and a lot of us are in just in our personal lives, uh, about making those decisions about now sort of coming back and um, coming back to normal, or we even, Danielle and I talk about with respect to the HCBS rules, how can we come back better than normal, right? Maybe a provider was, um, had, you know, great opportunity before COVID to look at further best practices for integration. And now you've had some time to think about it and had some time to think about things a little bit differently. So, um, you know, again, thinking about those areas of focus for the HCBS rules, would you share some examples of your plans to either return to where you were pre-COVID or even better, your plans for increasing your organization's alignment with the intent of the HCBS rules after the COVID risk is minimalized. And I'll, I think we'll jump in and have you guys talk about that. And then um, I have some questions that I'll read for the group um, to kind of help with that peer-to-peer -peer technical assistance around some challenges people have experienced and might want to get their peers um, input on that. So. Uh, anybody want to share, you know, what are your plans moving forward and, and make, what have you thought about that you can, that you can enhance maybe that you weren't doing prior to COVID? And if you like to talk, uh, use the raise your hand function and I will um, give you access to talk or you can use the Q&A uh, chat box to share. Don't be shy. Even if you're even if you're experiencing some challenges as you think through this, that conversation in and of itself is helpful to not only you but to others. So, um, again, this is a this is a this is a, a no judgment zone. This is just hey, I'm struggling with this. Um, and as we're thinking about you know sort of uh, getting back to where we were or better. Yeah, we have some hands raised. Um, I am unmuting Jody Roth Jones. You should be able to speak Hi. now. Hi. We um our center our our program is out of a community center, and since the center's been closed by the city, we have been not in person right now. But we've done everything virtually, and once we get back into things, and then past like where we have to keep people in pods for a period of time as we work through things, our ultimate goal is instead of having two dedicated programs that are within the community center, we change to more of here's four rooms for the day, here's what's gonna happen in each room and maybe have them select mm -hmm. on Monday kind of what track they wanna look like that week and what, what activities they wanna do. And then that would kind of place them in that room or that pod for the week, allowing them the choice of if they wanna focus more on crafts or if they wanna focus more on exercise or gaming um, or if they want to go on a specific outing, kind of letting them choose what pod or path to take for a week at a time so that maybe they can also engage with different peers as well. Um, but we're trying to work through if everyone wants to go a certain direction, how to have enough staff to cover the ratios of what mm -hmm. their choices are. So that's kind of one of our holdups to the idea. Thank you, Jody. Yeah, we totally understand the staffing issues and 
and allowing choice kind of, you know, bash heads sometimes. Um, let's see, it looks like Joe Bonanno would also like to speak. Sorry if I pronounced that wrong. No, you did, you did fine, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Um, yeah, as I'm listening to the others, I mean, we've done a lot of, of similar things. I'm with STARS um, in uh, Scottsdale. And, you know, we've, uh, you know, being creative was essential. I mean, we've looked at ways that we could maximize the numbers of people that we continue to serve, whether it's virtual, ramping up in-home services. We have um, a center-based employment uh, area that, um, you know, we've had to reduce the capacity of that, like, significantly because of social distancing. We've even, like, taken over former offices to create different cohorts so that we could have as many people in the building as possible and and we also did you know by doing that we were able to isolate smaller groups of people so they were only coming into contact with the same people every day um, it's worked fairly well and we've been able to maintain our contracts with business partners in the community uh, to keep those um, products uh, you know moving along with with the folks that we are able to serve um, one of the challenges is it still leaves out a large number of CBE participants, uh, their members that, um, you know, are, are without services. And so we've, we've explored some, some uh, creating kind of like a, an upper level uh, type DTA program that, that, that focuses on uh, more upper level skills training that's non-vocational because mm -hmm. it can't be. But that's, you know, tried to make that available to some and that's, that's working out fairly well. Um, the staffing right now is our biggest challenge because as we're starting to open back up the, the day treatment, the DTA programs, um, we're, we're um, you know, we're, we're looking at doing that in phases. So we're not bringing everyone back at once. But now the, the, after all the twists and turns, all the, you know, problem solving, now we have staffing shortages that we just can't seem to, to get past that. So it's always something. <laughs> Absolutely. It sounds like you guys are doing some really interesting work. Thanks. So Joe, it sounds like, this is Dara, so it sounds like if I can re-articulate the idea for the day program, it's kind of like a, it's a day program that's focused on building some of those sort of, you know, basic fundamental transferable skills, if you will, that aren't necessarily employment related, but certainly key success skills for employment, right? So it's it's sort of that that kind of pre 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 vocational step. Um, so I think that that sounds like a really interesting idea. Yes, that's exactly it. I mean, the communication, working as a team, being able to you know follow instructions um, and and follow through on a project and those types of things that will help with employment. So absolutely, that's it. Danielle, do you have any other hands raised at the moment? No hands at the moment, if you want to go to the chat. Okay, so these are some of the questions, some of the challenges that people have experienced um, that relate to the HCBS rules. And I just wanted to raise these for the group discussion to see if anybody has any um, you know, insight or, or additional technical assistance to add. So. Kay is talking about the issue with, with parents or guardians who may be deciding to limit um, an individual's access under the HCBS rules. And so, um, you know, for example, they don't want them to leave the site. Um, um, they want them to stay at the site all day. And, and so our question is, how does this play with the rule of coming and going as the member desired? Um, so, okay, I'll kind of answer from a policy perspective, and then maybe some of the folks can also jump in to say, like, how they've addressed um, the issue where parents or guardians are limiting the member versus there being a health and safety restriction. So, certainly, this should be discussed during the person centered planning or the ISP team meetings. Um, and, um, you know, CMS has said, um, regarding the HCBS rules that, you know, even, even guardians should be, um, you know, if the member really has no health and safety reason to be limited, 
um, then that should be pushed. You know, the team should push that discussion. Obviously, um, members and families are gonna have their transition into this just like you all are. Um, and that may come a little bit later. So obviously you, you have to make sure everybody's comfortable, but really having those hard discussions about, you know, is this really necessary or what can we do to help you feel better, but also take some calculated and thoughtful risks. I don't know if anybody else has any advice or guidance around how to support these conversations with members and their families when they're they're limiting their engagement um, in the broader community. Does anybody else have any specific thoughts on that? And I apologize, someone just had their hand raised and I pushed the wrong button and I don't know, I don't recall the name. So please, if you just had your hand raised, raise it again and I'll let you, I'll let you to talk. Diane. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Go ahead, I wasn't Diane. the one who raised my hand before, but um, oh. I, I think in, in, um, in talking about what, what Dara just spoke about in the comment earlier about somewhere um, some guardians don't want the individuals to be out and about in the community. I think when I look at the HCBS rules, I think that that's also a part of it um, is that we're giving members choice. And not mm -hmm. everybody chooses to be out and about and, and, and be out in the community. And, and that's one example of where we are really respecting their choice. Um, maybe they just want to be with their, in their comfortable zone with their friends at the day program doing fun things there. And that's, that's accepting their choice and, and, and respecting that. And, you know, just because they have a developmental disability doesn't mean that they are not also an introvert. <laughs> um, so, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know, I think that the, that's where the team has to come together and really respect everybody's individual's choices. I mean, those of us who run operate day programs, we know we've got those individuals that will go on any outing, whether it's someplace that they're not interested or not, because they like to be out there and they like to go. They're the extroverted type. And so, you know, we're really respecting choice in what an individual wants to do. As long as I feel as providers, as long as we're offering those kinds of things, it's not up to us to force anybody to engage or disengage. We're offering and, and, and we're showing that um, we can broaden their horizons as much as they want to see. We're not going to you know, just because they may choose not to go on an outing or they may choose not to um, really be doing a lot of interacting, maybe for them, you know, being there in a group and hearing everybody and seeing everybody is what they want. And so I think it's okay for us and for teams to acknowledge that not everybody is the same and not everybody, it doesn't, the program isn't, we're, we're not looking at um, judging the program based upon one individual's level of participation. It's, it's what are we offering mm -hmm. and what are all people interested in doing and how can we kind of come together for that and give them as much freedom as we can while still respecting their choices. I think Diane, you bring up a good point that it is about individualized, um, you know, part of what the, what the assessments are looking at is your overall settings ability to accommodate individual preferences or um, around engagement. So that could be somebody who is an introvert to your point, right? Um, that really is just more comfortable and enjoys, you know, staying at the program and playing games or whatever that means. And then also those individuals who would prefer to be more active and out, you know, or I should say out, you know, and, and, and involved in different activities. Um, so I think you make a good point there. Um, we've had um, a number of discussion in the chat around staffing um, and just people commenting on just struggling with recruitment right now. Um, and um, 
um, you know, trying to, and, and as Danielle alluded to earlier, obviously your ability to comply with the HCBS rules sometimes can be challenging from a staffing perspective, because if you have folks who um, um, engage in different activities or new, need different types of supervision, that can be challenging. Um, although the idea I think was interesting of the program that had basically you know, four rooms or four types of activities for the day and people could pick amongst those. Um, but maybe we can just take a moment since staffing seems to be um, a larger issue is, you know, is maybe just a few moments for folks to talk about any kind of creative recruitment ideas that they're engaging right now with respect to COVID and um, or the staffing shortage to, to just to see if there's any, you know, kind of information sharing that can be shared amongst the group. Anybody willing to talk about anything that might have worked for you? Um, this is Diane again. I think in talking with other providers, we've certainly seen and, and we're doing the same um, providers that are um, seeing more uh, benefit in getting internal recruitment where, you know, we do a recruitment, um, uh, a bonus for our staff who recruit somebody else new that seems to be the best. I think a lot of people are seeing right now that um, just regular advertising isn't being as successful. So um, we're def we've increased our uh, referral bonus that we've been doing. We're, um, we're in the process of, of discussing perhaps a type of sign-on bonus. Um, all of these things right now is certainly in, in the number of years that I've been um, in this field, I've not seen it this difficult to recruit as it is right now. Um, I'm hopefully, hope, hopefully people will have gone through their um, tax refunds and their, uh, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. you know, hopefully that money will be running out more quickly and maybe we'll get some uh, folks coming on because it certainly is a challenge. And um, I, I feel like with coming you know, it's something that we're gonna really have to work with the state on as uh, what our reimbursement levels are for direct support staff. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Thanks, Diane. Anybody else have any um, thoughts to share around staffing? and staffing challenges, I do want to put a plug in that the notice for the differential adjusted payment, the final notice went out on Friday. Um, so make sure that you connect with um, on the access website under the uh, notices that should be out there. Um, and I think we've linked to it as well in these communications. So you'll want to make sure that you avail yourselves of that and whatever opportunity that affords you. Um, like Jody uh, Dugan wants to talk. So you should be able to unmute yourself now, Jody. Yeah. This is Jody. Hi. Um, so our, our, my issue is that um, for the, the new employees that are, that are trying to hire, they need a higher rate of pay. So what, if you can expand a little more on what you said just came out, uh, I'm not sure about what that is. An additional adjustment or something? DTA? Yeah. DTA? I'm having to the pay difference. more money as an hour to hire anyone right now, a lot more. <laughs> so the differential adjusted payment, and we can um, try to send out a link about but it maybe afterwards, or maybe Danielle, you could even, um, maybe one of us could try to, while we're talking, um, put a link in here, but it's an opportunity for um, providers meeting certain quality of uh, criteria around um, the HCBS rules, which pretty much means if you attended the training today, you're getting the DAP. 
Um, you just have to complete the attestation form that's on the website. And it's um, where DDD will provide you an additional half of a percent on top of the rate that you get paid that you bill for each um, service. So it's an incentive to try to help support you all in transitioning to comply with the HCBS rules. Um, so we'll try to put a link in the chat here in just a minute so that you can uh, refer back to that. Okay. And I'm trying to get that right now. Just give me one second. So I'll keep going here. Um, as far as um, one person actually talked about with regard to staffing, kind of a little bit different of a, of a twist on it, though, not talking about necessarily challenges, but just utilizing staffing in a unique way. Um, Ashley says they have an administrative position um, that's dedicated solely on planning for community-based activities, including scheduling local events, employment training, um, and, um, um, you know, kind of speaks to the funding component of it, but also um, that that helps kind of support them to, to place a priority on those and, and to be able to find those opportunities in the community. Um, uh, Shireen, I hope I'm saying that correctly, says, um, regarding phasing back in, I'm taking the slow phased approach back to reopening, reactivating one staff and then bringing back one to four members for that one staff to work with. This allows a transitional period for members and gives me an opportunity to adjust individual supports as needed for members who may be returning with increased behaviors and or changes in their medical or health needs. Um, also echoes the comment about struggling with staff. Laura talked about recruiting at colleges um, as, a, as an option. And we would also say um, recruit with the high schools. A lot of high schools now are doing things like direct care worker training. Um, so that would be another opportunity as well. We would uh, ask you to, you know, um, consider. Let's see here. Excuse me while we. Um, Dana says, outside of this, is there a way to connect with other providers? Um, so I would probably recommend Dana um, or one of the other providers. Maybe you all could address that question um, with the different maybe associations or different other outlets that providers can use to engage and network with one another. Okay, so let's go back up. One of the other comments that folks talked about as far as challenges was that, um, I think this was noted when we talked about provider participation in the service planning meeting. So when we talk about person-centered planning, we're also talking about the ISP. It, to us, it means the same thing. So just to clarify. Um, so Kay talked about how day services are rarely invited to the ISP meeting. Um, and these meetings also take place generally in the group homes, which are in the evening and they're closed by then. So does anybody have any thoughts or advice on how to work in tandem with the other settings and the support coordinator to support all the various providers being engaged in these meetings? Anybody have any ideas that you'd like to share? Uh, just a reminder, if you want to share on the phone, please use that raise your hand function. Go ahead, Diane. Um, I think that, you know, it really varies. I feel like what geographic area you're in um, mm -hmm. at how well support coordination does with making sure that um, day programs are invited to 
the uh, 90 day or the, the planning team meetings. And I think it's something that we still have to continue to work on with support coordination in some areas because right now everything's done electronically. Um, meetings are not occurring in the home uh, right now. So I think it's a matter of really reaching out to those support coordinators and the support coordinator supervisors and um, getting them on board with making sure that the day program is invited because that absolutely is an issue in some geographic areas that need to be day programs are a very important part of the team and they need to mm -hmm. be a part they need to be a part of that planning process but it definitely is a challenge I think in some geographic areas thank you Diane uh, Lou I was oh looks like Diana Taylor wants to share so I am allowing her to talk Diana okay um, you just have to unmute yourself and you should be able to speak now. Okay, I think you can hear me now, right? Yep. yep. Okay, Hi, and I'm sorry, I just wanted to jump in. I know we have challenges with support coordinators inviting um, the special, specifically the employment programs and the DTAs. Um, occasionally we run into those issues even with our HDBS services. Um, please reach out to the support coordinator supervisor and, or the APM or the DPM of the district if you're continuing to have those problems. Also discuss this with your guardian and the family members. Um, they also can ensure or you know feedback to the support coordinator that we need to have all services at the table. Um, it's very important that our day programs are included in this process. So again, if you have major challenges, even locating who that supervisor is, don't hesitate to reach out to me and I'll help to kind of direct that behind the scenes. We can get you to the right district people to talk to to improve that process. I also want to say too that, you know, part of these, we plan on, ho on hosting and facilitating many more of these types of sessions. And, and I think today, part of the first round of sessions is getting an idea of what are those topics that are that that maybe are the biggest barriers um, to your success with HCBS rules compliance so that we can work through these. And so we'll be partnering with our all of our health plans, including DDD and their workforce development administrators to um, facilitate future sessions around particular topics. So this is certainly something that um, I just know being a support coordinator 25 years ago, it was hard and think about doing it without email, um, trying to call everybody and coordinate schedules and those kinds of things. And it, it was, it's just a logistical challenge on top of just some of those other things around, you know, day programs are not open in the evening and traditionally maybe members and families can meet more in the evening when the group home can meet. And, so all of those different things. So, um, but um, it, it's not to say, I think we're getting a good idea of some of the challenges um, that you all, real world challenges that you all are experiencing um, that are impacting your ability to comply. And I think those are things that can be future topics. So I just want you to just reassure you that we, we won't be leaving these, um, that we may revisit them in the future. Uh, we have Jody uh, Dugan on the phone. You can you can speak. Yeah, uh, this is actually Steve with the send. Also, uh, Jody's here with me. You know, I think that I wanted to backtrack for a moment. One of the, the frustrations that we're seeing is that you know a couple of I think some of the other uh, commenters have pointed this out with the unemployment benefits and now with the ongoing stimulus package, people that at entry level of twelve dollars an hour don't have an incentive mm -hmm. to come back to work. So now they're looking for that $14, $15 to come back to work. And with the reimbursements remaining what they are at $11, it's very hard to uh, be able to provide those uh, people demanding those kinds of wages. And so a two-part question is, one, uh, is the DDD recognize this? And is there any, uh, I mean, I just saw a survey come out a, a week or so ago. Is there a, a movement afoot perhaps to, to try to raise the reimbursement to address this problem? Uh, and then secondly, you'd mentioned that there is, for attending this seminar, for instance, 
that there's a, a bonus uh, reimbursement of a half a percent. Well, half a percent on $11 an hour is not going to get you anywhere near uh, even minimum wage, let alone uh, $14, $15 an hour, which is the kind of money, frankly, you're going to need to pay a living wage with inflation uh, you know, and give quality uh, services to the members. I mean, these are just real life observations I'm making. Yep. So um, it, what I can say in response to that is when we when we worked on the um, uh, uh, transition plan and all the community and provider engagement that we did around the transition plan for the HCBS rules, um, apart from the center-based employment discussion, um, the rates was the secondary, you know, most um, secondary discussion to that. So. For the last two or three years regarding the HCBS rules, we've, we've continued to advocate to have a differential adjusted payment for pretty simple kinds of engagement. Um, I understand it may not address all of the needs that you have, but there certainly is a commitment to that and, and a commitment ongoing. It will be a little bit harder to get the DAP moving forward. Um, the other things is that there are, you know, um, uh, ask, you know, there is an acknowledge, or I want to say, how do I say this, um, to, to, to be uh, accurate, there are um, discussions around, um, you know, we've raised that discussion. I mean, if any, anytime you have a question about rates or input on that, that's really a DD specific discussion. Um, I will tell you just at the access level that we have a team looking at the HCBS rules just in general, but specific to provider rates, you definitely want to talk specifically to DDD. Um, so um, I think we are nearing our time here. Um, we are gonna capture some of these ideas um, and practices into, um, I, I don't know exactly what format they'll end up in, um, but we, we are capturing them. The session is being recorded um, and will be on the website um, along with the PowerPoint. And so um, we are hosting a series of these sessions. Thanks, Danielle. Um, we're hosting a series of these sessions for all the different provider types that need to comply with um, the HCBS rules. And so um, uh, we'll do that and then we'll kind of revisit key themes and discussion items. They may be unique to one setting or another, um, but we'll be looking at hosting many more of these uh, session or these part four sessions where there's this just basically more of a peer-to-peer -peer discussion. I'm really grateful. And Danielle and I are super grateful. Um, I know I can speak for her. We're not in the same location, but I know I can speak for her. You guys did a phenomenal job today of raising some really great discussion items for participating and sharing what you're doing, but also what are your challenges. Um, this really did meet the goal for our meeting today. I know there's still a lot more discussion to be had, but we really, um, first and foremost, feel like a lot of these things are more should be more peer-to-peer -peer discussions um, because you guys know what it's like to provide services day in and day out, and you are all the ones who have the experience and expertise. So thank you so much for, we were, we were worried there just might be a, one or two people who want to speak, and you guys did great. Um, so uh, be sure to sign up for the constant contact email list if you aren't already on it. We, we, uh, it's on our website under the Stay Informed tab. Like we said, there's, there's already a number of recorded training sessions from 2019 um, on the website, um, but there'll be more um, um, forthcoming, including this session. And then um, we will be posting the assessment tools um, and the transition plan guidance documents um, here soon. We're just making some final revisions, but um, you can expect um, in April to potentially receive notices from a notice from the health regarding your assessment. Um, those will begin to start in April. I think DDD is considering doing in-person on-site assessments, of course, following all relative protocols. Um, so that may be something um, that you hear from them when they reach out to you. 
In the meantime, if you have more policy related questions around the HCBS rules, or you've been doing some thinking and you want to, you know, get some clarification from us, uh, Danielle and I answer and receive or receive an answer the emails that come to that HCBS at azaccess.gov email address. Um, so please share those with us. Again, it might help inform some kind of communication we're going to do or some of these more of these best practices. Um, so a lot to come. We're incredibly grateful for your participation today. I know we didn't get through everything, but we are going to um, take the chat along with some notes that some of our colleagues have been taking and look to see how we can better support you in the future. Um, we at Access always want to take an opportunity to thank you um, for the work that you do um, day in and day out, particularly in a COVID environment, particularly in a tough environment around staffing. Um, you all make a difference in our members' lives, and, and you not only provide their services, but you also um, help them grow as individuals and people, and we're just so grateful to the work that you do. And know that um, you know we just want to support you to transition during this HCBS compliance phase, and it's still kind of new. Um, but we applaud the efforts that you're making um, in our members' lives and your efforts to comply. And we're just um, so grateful for you. And um, thank you for your time today and your engagement and participation. And we'll be following up with you shortly. Thank you so much, and have a good day.